All right. Well, it's great to have everybody here at FIBC today. It's wonderful to have people to worship with. Uh, praise the Lord that we can gather here. Um, to begin, I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. In that, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let me pray for us. Father, we rejoice in you. We rejoice in your salvation. We rejoice that we have been born again to a living hope through the gospel. And we thank you for the great love you've lavished upon us, Lord. Uh, and we're very mindful today as we gather that uh, we are sinners, Father. That our lives are far from your holiness and your glory. And yet we thank you through your redemption, through your grace, through filling us with your spirit, Lord, you lead us into the holy places that we may be your children. And we pray, Father, that you would guide us today, help us today. Uh, we do all this, Father, for your glory, seeking your honor and your praise. Just bless the preaching of your word, Lord. Bless all the worship that is done here today. And may you strengthen us and give us grace that we may run after you and pursue you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's wonderful again to have everybody here today. Again, just a joy that we can all gather and worship once again as, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's great just to be able to look out and see. My own kids are here. It's great to see other kids, you, your families, such a joy. And for all those who are online, we just uh, pray that, that you are blessed by this worship today. And we look forward when you can gather us here and we can worship together uh, in person. Just a few announcements. We don't have many, but uh, to begin with, after the service, for those of you who are on online, we will have a fellowship hour that Anne will be leading. So if you are online, I encourage you to join that since you can't be with us here today. And for those, uh, for all of you, just remember throughout the week, we do have different things going on, prayer groups, Bible studies, D groups. So we're still trying to utilize the online platforms that we have at our disposal so that we can still connect uh, and be together, even though for the moment we haven't yet uh, launched those to be again in person. Also, if we have, uh, uh, just remember that during this time, we want to be a people who are, are, are giving, a people who are wise with what the, what the Lord has entrusted to us. So uh, our slide maybe will appear online and, and here, but just remember you can give through mobile pay, uh, through your bank, however is most convenient to you. I just encourage you to continue to give. Uh, not just with your finances, but with your time, uh, with whatever resources the Lord has put into your hand, because we want everything that we have to be used for his glory, for the ministry among uh, God's people. So now I'm going to invite Christian up. He's going to lead us in a call and response for Psalm 103, and then he's also going to do a children's message for us today. Christian. Yes, it's good to be back together, and we're trying to keep it short, so we will do a special song at the end, but we're going to just stick with the call and response for our time of corporate worship. How do we feel about standing? Is that okay? Makes it more interactive. So you can look up here, and we will be doing Psalm 103, and there is instructions for what your response will be after I do the call. So let's do that together with joy. And let's try to make this worshipful to the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Okay, we got to keep the same pace. All right. <laughs> Who forgives all your iniquity. 
redeems your life from the pit. We're real Baptists here, aren't we? We gotta get <laughs> who satisfies you with good. Yes. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He will not always chide. He does not deal with us according to our sins. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, as far as the east is from the west, As a father shows compassion to his children, for he knows our frame. As for man, his days are like grass. For the wind passes over it and it is gone. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. To those who keep his covenants. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. Bless the Lord, O you his angels. Bless the Lord, all his hosts. Bless the Lord, all his works. All right. Thank you so much. You can have a seat. That was really a wonderful verse to read together. And it talked about our children's children blessing the Lord. So we actually have some kids here today. What a joy. So kids, if you want to look up here, I'm now going to be teaching a little message about the body of Christ. Can all you kids look up here and say hi? And you kids at home too, gather them around, say hi. We are going to be talking about the body of Christ. Of Christ. The Bible says that the church is a lot of different things, but the main thing, the most important thing maybe, is that we are a body. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says here about the body of Christ For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged all the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. Have you guys ever thought about that, that the church is a body? What if we were just a bunch of hands in our, in our, in our bodies? Would you be able to walk around? What if we were all a bunch of eyeballs? Would we be able to smell anything? I actually have a few examples of some body parts here with me today, guys. These are not body parts that you know from the outside, but from the inside. Can you see that? What is that? Can anybody shout it out? The adults can say it if the kids can't. Lungs. Yeah, those are the squishy things in here. <sighs> when you go like that. And what about this one? You guys all know that one. What's that? Brain, that's right, the brain. And then this one's pretty easy, I think. What's that right there? Heart, that's right. This is for my kids' homeschool curriculum, so there we go. And this is the kind of yucky one that all makes all the yuckies. What's that right there? Is it, which intestines is it, though? Is it the large or the small intestines? Large, that's right. And these, these are the... Kidneys. Kidneys remove a lot of the acid from our bodies. They're very important. So here I have a picture as well 
of all of those parts together. Can you guys see that at home? This is one of those books that my kids did not like to get as a Christmas gift, but then about a year later, they were like into it, you know? And we can see that all of those body parts that I just mentioned, even the kidneys under there, there's the lungs, they're all connected on the inside 100%. And the Bible says that the church is just like that. We're all different parts of the body. We might be the lungs, we might be the brain, we might be the things that make the yuckies, the intestines, that's not so attractive, the Bible says, but we're all important and we're all connected. And so as we gather again now, this is a chance for us to remember that we are a body and that none of us are unessential. None of us are unimportant, even though we have different roles. Some of us are on the council. Some of us clean up. Some of us just go out in the streets and invite people. Some of us pray, but we're all one in God's body. And that is a way of God showing us his glory as the designer and the head of the church. That's what Jesus is. He is the head. So that's kind of one thing for you guys to think about and maybe talk with your mama and papa today because we're going to keep talking about that in the big people sermon too. So you can talk with your mama and papa about this when you come home, maybe over dinner, okay? Thank you. I'm going to invite Pastor Conrad back up. All right. Well, we're hustling along here, so that's good. Trying to be responsible with our time. Let's get this. All right. Well, let me pray for us before we preach here. Father, we praise you because you are a great king. You are a great God. You are a great father. Um, we thank you for for the church. We thank you for today, Lord, where where we can look at the church and and see what your purposes are, Father, in bringing us together and why you have assembled the church. And and I just pray, Father, for your grace and your your blessing as we do this today. I hope, Father, we are all aware that that we need you. That, that, that I need you, those who are listening need you. Father, we need you to come and to work among us. Um, we need your grace, Father. Help us today, Lord. Let, let your word uh, reach into us, Father, and mold us and shape us, Father. Conform us to the image of Christ through, through the teaching of your word. We thank you, Father, for your presence among us. Um, come, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, as we mentioned last week, we are taking a, a brief pause in our series on Romans because our preaching time is, is limited by the current recommendations that uh, that we are encouraged to abide by. And we're trying to keep our services as short as possible, kind of around the 30 minute mark. Um, and when those recommend recommendations are eased, we plan on to return to our regular service uh, time and structure. But in the meantime, we are going to do uh, that shorter format, and we're diving into this short, brief series on the church. And last week, Christian kicked us off by preaching on John 13 and the necessity of remaining in Christ through remaining in and serving the church. And what I want to do today is build on that by turning our attention to Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 27. And if you have your Bible, either paperback or digital, I encourage you to go there with me. Uh, in this passage is where we get that famous refrain that no doubt many of you are familiar with, where it says, do not neglect to meet together. Uh, but we need to be aware of the context in which that comment is made, because the reasoning behind the command uh, to not neglect meeting together is very specific in this passage. The author of Hebrews doesn't simply make sure uh, you know that we are to gather together, but he gives reasons for why we must gather together, for why Sunday worship and, cor uh, and the corporate communion uh, and unified fellowship is sustenance for faith in Christ. And so that's, that's my goal for us today is to show why gathering together as the church is absolutely necessary and, and not to be marginalized or neglected by anyone. So let me begin by reading this passage. I encourage you again to follow along, starting in verse 19 of chapter 10 in Hebrews. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, 
by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So to begin, did you notice how he's speaking corporately here? He isn't speaking individually, but collectively. He says, brothers, we have confidence to enter the holy places. A new and living way was opened for Jesus uh, by Jesus for us. We have a great high priest. Let us draw near. Let us Hold fast. Let us consider. Salvation is not a private affair. Knowing Jesus is not merely an individualistic pursuit. Drawing near and holding on to Christ is not something to be done in isolation. All of this life with Christ is inherently communal. Entering into the holy places by the blood of Jesus is done in communion with other Christians. The life of faith at its core is one that, that happens in the household of God with our brothers and our sisters at our side. As verse 21 says, we have a great high priest over the house of God. And who dwells in a house? A family. And a family is what we are because we are all sons and daughters of the Father. If we are indeed in Christ, we are brothers and sisters in that household. But what happens when a family member isolates themselves in a house? You know, think of the stereotypical image of a teenager who, who retreats or withdraws from the family, is in their room with a closed door all the time. They're separate from their family. What happens when that type of separation and withdrawal occurs? The family suffers both the individual who has isolated themselves and the family as a whole, because it, it's, it's breaking uh, and striving against the father's purposes for the family. He made families to be together, and the church is a family. It is the eternal family that supersedes every other. Our own households and families are merely shadows of that greater reality to be unfolded in the end. All those who belong to God are united and brought into this family, the house, household of God. Faith is a family affair. In other words, it is only properly lived out in the church, this family. We need to do all we can to, to rid ourselves of this, of this individualistic mindset uh, as, though family, uh, as though faith is primarily about me and just pursuing my own personal and private devotion. Of course, that, that's important. It's necessary. But if a personal, a personal and individualistic uh, notion of faith is the only or the primary way in which we understand our fellowship with God, th then we've left the traditional uh, Christian teaching, which has always emphasized the togetherness of Christians. Church is not a matter of just fulfilling a social duty, but it's fundamentally about life with Christ, about worshiping God as he has dictated we are to do, do knowing him as he has called us to know him. And Hebrews 10 paints this picture quite clearly because it says, let us draw near with a true heart. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. And he grounds all these things that we are to do in our togetherness. 
He ties them all together through our communion and being brought to Christ and abiding in Christ and obeying Christ. These things will not happen in any true or significant way outside the communal fellowship of the church because the church is where the spirit of God is is active. It is where he dwells and where he works in power. And in this I can assure you, and I'm sure you have seen this for yourself, but if you, if you know of any Christians who have tried to live the life of faith apart from the church, independent of a local church, who don't take gathering on Sunday with other believers uh, seriously, or if they don't take the Lord's Supper seriously, or corporate prayer, or serving, or Christian fellowship seriously, their faith is, is always weak, ineffective, and often prone to wandering. In all my, when I, since I started training for ministry, any time I've seen someone separate themselves from the local body, they suffer in their faith. If these aren't the regular rhythms in our faith, then our faith will atrophy and, and deteriorate because we would be depriving ourselves of the sustenance of faith. We will be like a ship adrift on the sea, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So it's important that we recognize when we gather together, when we partake in the sacraments, when we hear God's word and his truth proclaimed, when we pray together, when we serve and suffer together, God is at work in our midst, feeding us on himself, sustaining us and filling us with his grace for perseverance and sanctification and growth in Christ. What happens when Christians gather together is not merely sociological practices with natural outcomes or natural consequences. That could not produce genuine Christian faith or real Christian living. As Jesus said in Matthew 19, Christian life is impossible, but with God all things are possible. When we are together, the Holy Spirit is at work to accomplish the impossible in us. We, we are not brought to Jesus in order to live independent lives, but dependent lives that rely on the Father and the grace that he pours out through the Spirit who is at work in the church, at work in you and through you. To, a, to attempt to, to live a Christian life uh, cut off from the regular personal communion between Christians in the church is ultimately going to be an exercise in futility. Again, I, I've never met a thriving Christian who neglects gathering with the church, and that's because there is no such person because they're neglecting God's means of grace to neglect gathering with other believers is going to be to neglect one of the fountains of God's embodied and tangible grace in this world. And if we look at verse 25, Hebrews connects this idea of gathering together with being prepared for what the author calls the day, uh, meaning the day when we stand before God in judgment it says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So there is a strong association between living within the communion of the church and being ready to see God face to face. However, on the other hand, verse 26 follows that up with a warning, speaking to those who are sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. In other words, those who have not heeded the call of verse 25, people who have obviously neglected the grace that comes through gathering with other Christians, people who have, who have clearly made the church a peripheral concern. Um, um, notice, uh, or sorry, but because of that, Hebrews says, that they are on a path of deliberate sin. And that can be tied to the fact that they've cut themselves off from the church and the grace God bestows through his presence in the church. Notice the transition that occurs from verse 19 all the way to verse 27. It begins by speaking about a confidence we have to enter the holy places and ends 
by speaking about a fearful expectation of judgment and about God's adversaries. This, the, the, that transition hinges on neglecting to meet together, which then as Hebrews assumes means people are willfully rejecting the gospel. Because their habit is to neglect coming together with the church. They do not draw near to the Father with, a, with a, what, he, what he says, a true heart full of assurance of faith. He says they do not hold fast to their confession of faith in Christ, and they will not be stirred up to love and good works. So all that remains for them is a path of deliberate sin. What we do on Sunday and the things we do as a church throughout the week, it is of no small consequence, but our joining in the communal nature of the church has massive consequences, eternal, uh, 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 eternal implications. In other words, it isn't optional if you want to be a genuine member of, of God's family. And, and this is what has made this past year so difficult for the church, not just our church, but the global church, the, the global church and it has made of its hardship throughout the world. Yes, we've held our services online in an attempt to honor the governing authorities, but it has not been without detriment to you, to me, and to the church as a whole. It's a blessing we have the technology that we're even utilizing uh, right now to do things online. But we shouldn't think that that is somehow an adequate substitute because in many ways it's fundamentally at odds with what we are called to do, how we are called to gather together. We cannot have the communion of faith we are called to so long as we remain online and separate from one another. The Christian faith uh, uh, necessitates living life beside each other, worshiping together on Sunday and being in and out of each other's houses and apartments throughout the week. This doesn't mean, of course, that we want to disregard safety and government regulations. Those things are important. And, and I think throughout this year, we've tried to honor those very well throughout the whole Corona crisis. However, Gathering together again must be of chief importance for all of us because we cannot live the Christian life without being together. The danger of doing church online, like, like we and many other churches have done throughout the past year, is that it has a tendency to make a church a lot like a program or a podcast. It, it isolates us and turns us into consumers who tune, tune into the service and then we tune out. Uh, and, and we get our, our dose of praise music, the teaching we need, and then we go our own way. But that isn't a Christian model of church. That's a market-driven model of church. And over time, it will suck your soul dry of any truly God-glorifying faith. When we gather, we don't just do it with an intent to, to gain like when we go shopping. We don't gather uh, because we intend to be entertained like we are when we're at a football game. And we don't come to God to give him something as though he needs anything from us. We gather as a church because we recognize our desperate need for grace, our desperate need for the Holy Spirit to dwell among us and work in us. We don't come to church as consumers, but covenant keepers. The church is not about consuming as though there's some type of transaction that needs to take place in our midst or occur during the service or in our prayer meetings. It's about the triune God giving to us and, and, and us living out our covenant life with him who has saved us and made us a people of his own possession. Since the church is fundamentally about our covenant life with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gathering together is not a voluntary thing we do. We don't come when it's convenient or when we feel like it. We don't come only when our favorite preacher is speaking. We don't come only when the time doesn't conflict with something else we want to do or our hobbies. We come recognizing our many weaknesses, our frailties, knowing we need to be shaped by God in this place with his sons and daughters in our midst to see his love formed in us and, and his truth rooted in our hearts. And one of the, the loves that he forms in us in during this time is a love for the church. 
he sacrificed, suffered, and died for the church. Therefore, you are called to do the same for the local body of believers you live with and beside. And this is done by his power, in his strength, and his grace that is working in us, because apart from him, we can do nothing. And my hope is that, that none of this seems a burden, because, of course, gathering together as the church, it means sacrifice. It means loving, even when love is going to be hard to give. But if we have the mind of Christ, we will come to see that, that meeting together as the family of God should be, should be full of revelry and joy and merriment. Because, it is what, because gathering together to enjoy God and the people of God, that is what we were created to do and that is what we will do forever. So don't neglect this family. Let us be a people who are in the habit of gathering as often as we can because we know our gathering is not in vain. God has appointed it as a means of grace to build and to strengthen all of us for his glory and our eternal joy in him. If FIBC is your church family while you live in Copenhagen, then this is where God has called you to abide in him, to love his people, to grow in your faith, to receive his grace. And do not neglect this, because if you do, you do so at the expense of your drawing near to Jesus. You're holding fast to your confession and your conformity to Christ. All the things that, that Hebrews 10 specified there in those verses we read. So I want to close with a quote from Ignatius in a letter that he wrote to Polycarp while he was on his way to Rome to be martyred. And this is what he tells Polycarp, who was a bishop in Smyrna. And I love this quote. He says, train together with one another, compete together, run together, suffer together, rest together, get up together. Let none of you be found a deserter. And I pray that all of this would be true of us, that we might be a church that trains together, competes together, runs together, suffers together, rests together, gets up together, and that not a one of us would desert this body and wind up in that fearful expectation of judgment that Hebrews warns us about. May our vision of the church be exactly what Hebrews and Ignatius lays out, a family that remains together for the glory of God and trusts in his grace to build and sustain our faith. And I get that this, this can be hard as an international church because some people here know that you're only here for a limited time. And because that is the case, sometimes you just don't feel like putting in the effort and, and making roots because you know that they're just going to be uprooted again in a few years time. But my encouragement to you is do not let that be the case. Because wherever you are, you are called to root yourself deeply, to live in that body so that the Lord may draw you closer to himself and strengthen you and build you up. That, that is your calling. Even if you are here, if you know just for a semester, just for a year, just for two years, three years, however long you're here, I, I encourage you, root yourself here. We, we desire that, and that is... God's will for your life, to be rooted in whatever church family that you find yourself in. Let me pray for us today. Father, we, we, we praise you. We thank you for the church. And Father, we confess that, that many of us often do not love, do not treasure the church and, and, and the body of believers as you yourself do. And we pray, Father, that you would would turn our hearts to love the church, turn us to want to be with your people. Uh, it's fully aware, Lord, I myself understand that, that sometimes there's just a, a desire just to be at home and want to be alone. But we pray, Father, that we would be a people who, who, who gathers together, a people who, who gathers and fellowships together with a rich communion that, that is given by the Spirit's work in our lives. Help us to have this mindset in, in our faith, Lord, to be devoted to these people that you love and you have called to yourself. 
Help us to embody the call of the church, to truly be a church that will get together. And we just pray, Father, that as we gather, you would do the things that are specified in Hebrews, that we would be draw, that we would draw near and our confession would be held fast to and we would be stirred to obedience and to love. Let these things occur in us, Lord. We just, we just pray, Lord, that you would remove the rest- restrictions that, that, uh, and the recommendations that we're currently under so that we once again can gather as a full body. So that we don't have to, to have anybody just watching as a spectator from home. But even if they are at home, Lord, help them to, to, to commune with the body as best they can. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Ellie is going to come up and lead us in a song. For those of you online, you are welcome to sing along. Those of us in here, we're not supposed to sing, so just sing in your heart. And the the song we're going to sing is actually uh, a version of Psalm 121. So as we... uh, lift our eyes to the hills not that there are very many of those in Copenhagen but as we lift our eyes to the hills we consider where our help comes from it comes from the maker of heaven and earth my eyes up to the hills where does my help come from my help comes from the maker of the heavens and the earth he will not let my foot be moved he keeps my journey safe Oh, my soul, praise the Lord most high, strong to save, he upholds my life forevermore, he will be my life. My eyes up to the Lord most high. He is my shade at my right hand, my shelter in the storm. No sun by day, no moon by night shall ever bring me harm. He will not slumber, will not sleep. He watches all my ways. Oh, my soul, praise the Lord most high. Strong to save, he upholds my life forevermore. He will be my life. I lift my eyes up to the Lord most high. my eyes up to the hills where does my help come from my help comes from the maker of the heavens and the earth the god of israel is my guide 
Whatever I may go, and in his strength I will abide until he leads me home. Oh, my soul, praise the Lord most high, strong to save, he upholds my life forevermore, he will be Thank you, Elia. Beautiful to hear music. It was kind of hard not to sing along. I almost just stopped myself there a couple times. Um, well, if you're online, remember we do have a link uh, on our site for a fellowship hour. Be great for you to join that uh, if you're viewing online. If you're in here with us, uh, you're welcome. I think some of us are going to go on a walk around the lake. It's a beautiful day. Great time just to, to be together. Um, so I encourage you to join us for that if you're able. And now let me give us our benediction for the day from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May those words be fulfilled in your life this week. And again, there are still a few empty seats. So next week, we hope to see more of you here. Have a great week. Bye.